Hi, my name's Val Croce. I used to run a shop in Camden Town called Psychotronic, and out of the video shop came a video label, which put out a load of Ray Dennis Steckler films, as well as things like The Wild Wild World of Jane Mansfield, Orgy of the Dead. This place used to feature a lot back then. We used to do all-nighters, we used to do all-dayers. We had Johnny Legend, Sleaze Mania films here. We had Steve Apostoloff here. We flew uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis over. I had sex on the roof up there. It's great times, happy days. Let's have a look inside. I wanted to put on some shows that were a bit more than just going to the cinema and watching a film and they had absolutely no hesitation in agreeing to it, they said let's go for it, so we did. I always liked sci-fi movies and black and white movies, like just the mainstream you'd see it. When I was growing up we had three channels, that was it. There was BBC One, BBC Two, ITV and you could only watch what they were screened. But they did at late night, you'd often get, you know, came from out of space and stuff like that would be on the, and so I, I didn't really know about the more obscure American stuff until um, I think it was the Golden Turkey Awards. And at that point, I discovered the cinema, which is where we are at the moment in London, called the Scala. I'm standing outside the Scala Cinema, which is officially the scariest place in North London. It was the site in 1987 of the first Shock Around the Clock film festival which was kind of like the Woodstock for the bizarro generation. Every night they had different bills and it was sometimes some quite highbrow European art movie. And then the next night it'd be Russ Mayer triple bill. And at Saturdays they had all nighters. And you'd go at about 10 o'clock at night and you'd leave at six in the morning and the bar was open all night. 12 cans of Stella. And you could just drink beer and watch movies. So you're just like, oh my God, this is great. And at the time I was in a band called the Stingrays. And when we split up, it was quite, quite a socialist right-on band. So all the money went back into the band when we were going. So the guitarist had two really had, had nice Telecaster and a Rickenbacker and an AC30 Vox amp. So when we came to split up, I had nothing because I was the singer. So they said, well, we got three grand in the bank. You have the three grand and we'll keep our amps and guitars. So I was like, all right, what shall I do? I'm going to open a record shop. I wanted to open a record shop in Camden Town in London with lots of really good record shops. Usually good stuff's in there. Camden's really weird. You come in on a thing called the Westway, which features on a lot of the Clash music and stuff. And originally, there was going to be a branch of that coming to Camden, so they didn't develop it and it was just this scuzzy, unused Victorian sidings, and they just let people open market stalls there, so it was really funky, and loads and loads of weird people selling weird stuff. That period in the 80s, Camden was very, although it's sort of famous for its punks, actually, the history is rockabilly and rock and roll, and kind of all that kind of music. I'd say a band that probably had the most influence over Camden at that period was the Cramps than any other band. Everyone was into the Cramps, myself included. And I thought, how much stock can I buy with £3,000? And the answer's not a lot. So I'm thinking, oh, well, what do I like as much as I like music? And I was like, well, films. I'm really interested in films. Shocking the screen with a confidential expose of the go, -Go set, The Lurid Lives and Love. The wild and wanton all night parties where anything goes. Michael Weldon had just started, he'd done the Psychotronic Encyclopedia of film, and he just started the magazine. So I wrote to him and said, I'm opening a video shop, can I use the name Psychotronic? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I called my video shop Psychotronic. There was a, a record shop, and I knew the guy who owned the shop, Barry Appleby, and he had two record shops in the basement, two fair, fair sized rooms and then right at the back there was what's almost like a, a toilet cubicle like this really long thin um, room it was actually under the pavement which leaked just plastered the walls in video box holders and I was up and running it was great you had to go off Camden High Street through a very dodgy looking doorway 
down a set of concrete steps into a basement, through into the shop, which was a very low ceiling. Down the top of stairs, and past the giant wolfman sign, and you're bouncing in there in the, in the dark. There behind the counter was Bow holding court with a cabal of people sort of standing around him. And then there'd be like 30 or 40 people in the queue. You know, the police would come in and go, are you selling drugs? We used to do mail order, that was very lucrative. We used to do little black and white stuff like Ed Gein. And then obviously we had the bags made, which was great. It was a Beulah from It Conquered the Earth. Which I've always been my favourite Hollywood monsters. That period when he opened the shop was probably the worst censorship's ever been in this country. It was at its height between sort of I'd say 86, 87 to, to, to really 97, we had that 10 years. It was terrible times to be living in for censorship. One of the very first Camden film fairs, we were all doing the tape trading and suddenly plainclothes police came in, swarming in, there's fucking loads of them. Nobody moved, no one's allowed to leave the shop. We covered the back and the front. Can you all just stay where you're sitting, please? And of course, there's loads of us. There was about like 20, 25 of us in there. We couldn't move, so we just put things in our bag and we were like, fuck. There had been a big thing in England with what they called video nasties, and a load of films were blamed for violence and stuff, and they were all banned. So all these video shops had these films that they had to get rid of. And I had three grand, so I was going around to all these video shops and buying I Spit on Your Grave, Last House on the Left, The Evil Dead, all these films at the van. And I was thinking, oh, I can sell these. I was partners with a guy called um, Mike Delaney, who was in a band called Gallon Drunk. They, they were supporting Nick Cave and doing pretty well, and they're on telly quite a lot. I mean, they weren't huge, but they were certainly bigger than any band I've been in. They did really well. He was my partner in the shop. We, we would just go on buying trips. Every sort of little Indian grocery store had hundreds of these, and most of them were pre-certification, so you had all these uncut videos, and you just to go to all these weird bits of London, and can I buy it? You know, any of you, and they were always like, yeah, yeah, fine, and just buy it and get all this weird stuff. In Holland, you could pretty much get everything. Ilsa Sheewolf for the SS, Clockwork Orange, originals of all those, and I was thinking, oh, I can sell these for extra money, because you can't get them anywhere else. And then I used to do copies, but from an original, so it wasn't like third or fourth generation, all scratchy. At least it was a really good, really good first generation. And I used to sell them as first generation copies, colour photocopy sleeve. I was a bootlegger, basically. I remember an occasion that we went to a place in South London that was closing down, but we spent like hours trawling through the trays of the HS sets there. Nothing worth talking about. So, you know, we got together what we got together and we went to see the guy and Bell said, so, you know, if you've got anything else. Very much like something out of a film, he sort of looked round and went, and he took us down to the basement and I'm not making this up, I swear to God, there's was like rickety stairs down to the basement and he, he took out three or four trays of VHSs out of the way. He had two trays of Betamax Exorcist tapes. And he, he knew what he had, but he didn't know what he had. He sold them to us for like two quid a tape. And then we spent the next two weeks knocking them across to VHS, lighter fluid to get the labels off, sweat of God, cigarette ash rubbed into the label to age it. And I think we sold all of those for about 100 quid each. Oh, he was in there for, <clears throat> I don't know, a year or two. And then the, one of the record shops shut down. So I took over the big, bigger shop and I used the back room where I had all the stuff that you couldn't trade because of trading standards. That was the secret room. No one knew about that room unless they were vetted. Customer People used to come in and go, oh, have you got any, anything under the counter? And Bowers go, who's your favourite horror director? And they would go, oh, I quite like Jess Franco. And they would then quiz them on Jess Franco films for 10 minutes. And if they managed to answer the questions, they were allowed to go into the back room where all the good stuff was. So you'd always get people ringing up going, hello, have you got I Dismember Mama? And you'd always go, no, no, you don't stock. And then when you got to know different clients and different people that came in regularly who obviously weren't trading standards, you'd go, hey, around the back, we've got this, we've got that. Why there's no shame in having a service. Albert is not insane. He's emotionally disturbed and he needs help. The way they did it was if they thought you were all right, you'd do the front room first, then the back room. The back room was all sort of the band stuff. They had to be very, very careful because they could have been seriously fucking busted. There were some people going in and you knew that they were trading standards, basically, and I think they used Lino to fuck them off. You should have been so nosy. Please. <laughs> Doc. No, no. 
it, it was almost a cliche of they were wearing brown raincoats with their hats pulled down over their eyes. Um, but they always stood out. And then they would come up and ask if we had it, specifically ask if we had any video nasties in, to which we wasn't. Uh, no, obviously, you know, it's against the law. We can't sell that sort of thing. Here's a magazine about it, though, or here's a book, or here's a poster of one of them if you want to buy those. To which they sort of make, an, uh, make a face and then shuffle out again. Us today, we were the scumbags. There was a few times when they went in the back room and Trading Standards had actually visited the shop. They were in the shop. And I get a knock on the door saying, John, just stay in there, right? So I knew that there was a problem. They'd lock you in. Because Trading Standards didn't know about that back room. It was so concealed. And uh, I got locked in there once. And um, all I saw was this hunchback character looking through the tapes and this, this, this sort of, I don't know, I didn't know he was in there at first. I don't usually get sort of freaked out, but he did freak me a little bit. But I like the freaks, but he was something a bit genuinely unnerving about that guy. There was this fantastic guy who we used to call Mr Uncut. What a great customer Mr Uncut was. Is it Uncut? It's all right. Hello. Hi, hi. Have you got I Dismember Mama? Like, yeah, yeah, guy. Can I buy it? Yes, yes, you can buy it. Is it cut? Is it cut? No, it's not cut. You sure it's not cut? No, it's not cut. Okay. They are, I say, take it. Then the next week, hello. Hi. I watched it. Sorry? That film, I watched it. Well, I imagine you would have done. Yeah, well done. Yeah. He didn't. Sorry? He didn't dismember his mama. I live with my mum. Jesus Christ, what am I doing here? They had another guy um, called Mr. X. He was amazing. A man of a few words but he had a great Asian film collection. He had some real rarities. So he'd come in the shop and you'd talk films with him, but he would never tell you his real name, he would never give you his phone number, he would never give you his address. Um, little Japanese guy who was obsessed by raping movies. And, and he was called Mr. Rape, because he has it got rape in it? And you know, we, we would miss sell him. Yeah, there's a little bit of rape in this one, it is. But when he breathed, his nose made this crazy noise. And he'd always asked about New York Ripper. So he was a bit away. <laughs> we had a run in with um, Luigi Cozzi. He ordered a shed load of, of stuff off me and then wouldn't pay me. And I, and I couldn't do anything about it. But luckily, Lino spoke Italian. So we sort of managed to find a flight to, to Rome and got the flight number and everything. And I got him to ring up and sort of say, Yeah, right, I'm going to be on this flight. I'm going to come and get the money. If you don't mail it, and, and that worked, and he actually paid us. Well, it looks like real money at least. We used to do all sorts of things like photocopy sort of fanzines. So there was, there was just a plethora of information about really obscure movies, mainly from America, but in England we had the Shock Express. Yeah, there was DC from In the Flesh, uh, Jim McClellan from Creeping Unknown, they were regulars. Harvey Fenton obviously produced his own fanzines, but as well printed and distributed other people's fanzines. There was a guy who in, in England called Jonathan Ross, who's a bit like David Letterman, but he was really into weird films, and he'd gotten hold of the Research Incredibly Strange Film book, and he thought, oh, I can make a TV series out of it, and then I'll get to go out to America and interview Herschel Gordon-Lewis and Ted V. Michaels and Ray Dennis Steckler, etc., etc. Say, so, uh, I was just wondering, do they have blood banks in England? No. But they have a Liverpool. <laughs> And he was coming into the shop and asking me, you know, if I could get some films and da da da. And then once they'd done the production, I was like, if you got Ray Dennis Steckler's telephone number? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So I got his number and I rang up Steckler and I said, can I lease some of your films? And really easy, really nice. I mean, he's just like, you want to give me a thousand pounds for each movie? Great, send me the money, I'll send you some tapes. So I decided to start Mondo Movies. Mondo was that whole Mondo exploitation film, so that was just a great name. And then the song is a really obscure rock and roll thing by a guy called Florian Monday and his Mondos. And it just goes, Mondo, Mondo, Mondo. And I was just like... <laughs> Originally it was just a static, but then I had a mate who did graphics and I got him to do this really bad spinning, I mean, just ter on purposefully really terrible. I was just so pleased with it. And I had the extra innovation of having see-through boxes, so when you open them, press the books and all sorts of stills on the inside. So that was uh, the start of Mondo Movies. 
And I think the first three films we did were all Ray Dennis Steckler. I think it's Rat Finker, Boo Boo, Thrill Killers, and The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. I flew out to America with a bag full of contracts. I went around to various people and got signed. And Ray was, he was a bit here, there and everywhere, shall we say. You could bring him up and spend like an hour on the phone trying to get the answer to one question and you wouldn't get the answer. You'd, you'd leave a conversation about the answer, so. The TV show had been shown in the UK, but not America. So the first thing he'd done was left me with his girlfriend and children in the living room while he ran off into a room and sat down and watched this episode of the TV show. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I spent like an afternoon with him, signed a contract, he showed me around, showed me all his old reels and films and scripts, his editing suite. He had a video shop at the time. He tried to sell me lots of books, lots of videos. He then took me to a diner, his favourite diner, where we had to be there by five o'clock dead on, because at five o'clock all the staff started seeing happy days which he enjoyed immensely for some reason. Incredibly Strange Creatures. It's really weird. There's no monster musicals. And then whatever year the um, Incredibly Strange Creatures came out was also the horror of Party Beach. So there was all of a sudden there was two monster movie musicals, both saying, we're the first monster movie musical. That, that got through all right. Um, and Rat Finker Boo Boo. But the Thrill Killers, there was a couple of scenes in that which I had to cut. So I, because when you first put the movie in, you send a time-coded copy with the actual the time code in vision. So I used to sell uncut copies with the time code running so you could see it was uncut. I hope I'm not going to get arrested for this <laughs> subsequently. No, 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 I don't want to go back. Don't take me back. No, 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 I don't want to go back. I enjoyed doing it because I got to meet a lot of people that I might not have got to meet. I met Tora Satana, I met Russ Mayer, Johnny Legend was one of my favourites. <laughs> I don't remember how I got in touch with him, but I, I met Johnny Legend and I was in a band called the Earls of Suave. He used to tell me stories of going around to Tor Johnson's house. And, I mean, he was such a cool guy, he just knew everyone. And then he made that really weird like hardcore porn rockabilly movie Teenage Cruisers. Apparently he made it when they were making Dolomite. Like none of the Rudy Ray Moore mob would get up before three in the afternoon. So apparently he used to just take their, all their kit in the morning and film Teenage Cruisers and then drop it back with them before they got up. And he sort of filmed it on the back of Dolomite. I flew him over and we did a night at the Scala showing his Sleaze Mania, which he, he did, which was basically 50s movie trailers. And then my band learned his set. <laughs> We used to play with him in the day and then come down here and show a load of films at night, which was, was great. And then through him, I got Steve Apostolos. He said, you don't want to ring Steve Apostolos. Don't deal with him. And I was like, oh, she's the dead. I'm, I've got to. So I rang up Steve and I said, look, if we fly you over, can you bring a print of Orgy of the Dead? Then we can tell you sending it for, to put it onto video but we can also do an all-day Ed Wood Festival at the Scala and have the first UK premiere of Orgy of the Dead. He arrived at Heathrow, he had a white silk suit. As soon as we got out of the airport, he had a big cigar, and he's like, tell them Apostoloff is here, the great Apostoloff, I am here. Ah, oh, yes, Eddie Wood, I said to Eddie, and he's just going, oh God, and he's just going on and on, and they're sort of driving through Green Park, and he's looking at the bushes, going, I bet a lot of fucking goes in those bushes. And we're like, yeah, probably, yeah. You'll we get some whores, yes? And I was like, if you want, mate, you can get some whores, it's fine. And then I stood dumped him in my mate's flat and it was a real shithole. You put me in a fucking shithole. I was like, yeah, sorry mate, see you later. And the next day he rang up, what are we doing today? And we're like, oh, I don't know. We just took him out somewhere and got like, a lot of fucking goals on here. Yeah, yeah, and he sort of went on for days. And eventually the festival comes up and we show a bunch of Edward films. And then before Orgy of the Dead, I'd come out, I've got this PA, the sound system in the Scarlet was terrible. And the PA I'd hired was really shitty. And I was like, and now the, producer and director of Audio of the Dead, who scripted by Ed Wood and friend of Ed Wood and worked with Ed and knew, knew him well. Steve Apostle, I thought, hey, and he came out and just dried. He's like, uh, any questions? So 
So I was like, oh, I understand there's a good story about the rap party of Orgy of the Dead. He's like, oh, yes, yes. So I give Eddie money for food and drink, and he comes back, and he's got no food. He just got vodka, gin, whiskey, and I think, oh my God, for Eddie, this is food. Ha ha. And you're like, oh, ha ha. But then he, he was off and running. But the PA was so terrible, his Bulgarian accent was quite thick still, despite having lived in America for years. And it was just like muffled PA. He goes, it's, it's even what's longer. Yes, of course, one does the orgy of the dead. Or <laughs> and then but also Ed Wood. I said, Eddie, and the one thing they would do. And I was just going, what the fuck? And then he'd, he'd gone, ah, for a treat for you. I, the great Apostolov, have gone into the studio, myself, into the cutting room, and I have edited all my trailers. And we have a string of my trailers. So we're like, oh, extra. So I'll give it to the projectionist, and it's after he's finished mumbling. i so thank you, Steve, that was great. And now we've got an extra bonus. And the first couple come on, and they're quite graphic, not hardcore completely, but a few people get up, stomp out, and everyone else is going, yay! And then the next one comes on, and it's fucking upside down and back to front, and he's going, who fucking edited this together? Bastard! And he's shot out, I was like, oh, God. I think the first one we did, I don't know, and I guess it was probably Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Ross, incredibly strange pro, I've got the phone number for Herschel Gordon-Lewis. I never expected to be in this theater today. I salute you for having me here, you maniac. And we did an all-day Herschel Gordon Lewis Festival, which was really good fun. Um, and he, he was really charming, very suave. His wife had this sort of fur coat, very swooshy. But they took it all with good grace, this sleazy flea pit cinema, and it's really good. And we printed a load of Blood Feasts and 2018 one sheets, repros, and which we were selling. And that was, yeah, that was really nice. I, I was quite obsessed with a rockabilly singer called Ron Haydock and he'd done a great track called 99 Chicks which includes the fantastic line 99 Chicks are just my luck, not one of those girls I wanna find 99 Chicks should be just my luck, not one of the girls He was also a big film fan and did film fanzines and stuff and was in touch with all those guys that, met, that worked on all the AIP horror movies and stuff and they were doing fanzines on jungle movies and all sorts. And I think he then went to Boris J. Ackerman and worked on Famous Monsters for a bit. And then, a bit, a bit sleazy, he formed his own fanzine that looked exactly like Famous Monsters, called Fantastic Monsters. So I was really obsessed with him as well. I wanted to know from Forey about him. So I flew Forey out. We did a Famous Monsters of Filmland night, but he, he was making some cruddy documentary as well. So I then ended up having to drive him to where H.G. Wells wrote Time Machine. So I had to have a piece of camera going, between these two gateposts, the original manuscript for the... Yeah, OK, yeah, fine. And then he's like, now, oh, where's Mary Shelley's going? I'm like, oh, Bournemouth. Right, so let me just drive down to Bournemouth and do it. He goes, the only thing I know is definitely in the church. And we found it in the cemetery outside the church. Well, that's fine. We found it and that was good. So we did a piece to camera there. And to spice that up, Ray Harryhausen, who did all the stop motion effects on the Sinbad films and things, he knew Forry. So I got him down as well just to spice it all up. It was quite sweet. Well, there's all these, these guys that were obviously film fans in the 50s. So it was a much older audience than we normally had. Um, I remember Dave Vanian, who's the lead singer of The Damned, was there, was dressed in black leather with his like, stash of famous monsters going, Forry, can you sign these for me? So yeah, it, was, it, was, it was really good. Then we did other things. We did All Night Elvis. We had some bands of Elvis impersonators playing in between and screened loads of Elvis films. We did, let's say, Johnny Legend, Sleaze Mania Night. I can remember going to the Scala and um, Gallon Drunk playing live and the movies they showed was Get Carter. The band played and then they showed Confessions of an Opium Eater. And these were, they were, what a day. I mean, that's just punk. My favourite, I think, is the William Castle double bill. We've done the Tinder and House on Haunted Hill. And we crawled around under the seats, putting uh, doorbell buzzers. And then we showed House on Haunted Hill the same night with the 3D skeleton on a pulley system. The House on Haunted Hill in a merger with this really crappy blow-up skeleton that we sort of pulled out and then got, it got stuck in the middle of the thing with people chucking beer cans and popcorn at it. Everything is always very disorganised and very chaotic. 
Yeah, it was really, it, I mean, the Scala was great because they used to let us do stuff like that. It was sort of an extension of the shop. There all the people, there would be all the customers from the shop would just all, they'd all decamp from Camden down to King's Cross and carry on partying. It was great. We're like addicts at the end of the day. We live for it. Does this world exist where virgin beauty is bartered for opium? Back in those days, it was a completely different world. There's, there was a representative for Russ Meyer and then in Wardour Street, which is where the, all the film companies were, there was this, these little shoebox offices with weird guys, and there was this guy, I can't remember his name now, who used to represent Russ, and that's where we used to go to see if we could get some Russ Meyer stuff, which never happened. And another guy was a guy called Dick Randall, and he, he was this weird-looking guy. Like, obviously he had grey hair, he dyed jet black, greased back, and his big horn-rimmed glasses and moustache, and he had this massive office on Wardour Street called Hammer House, which was a home of the Hammer Films when it was going and now it's just every different room had a different film company in it and Dick Randall had this shoebox office and we'd heard about him and we knew that he, he'd done mon, um, pieces, Paris Ooh La La and he owned or said he owned the rights to the wild wild world of Jane Mansfield which we really wanted to put out and it was hilarious it was like Steve Apostoloff all over again but without the Bulgarian accent so we, we did a deal on just the wild wild world of Jane Mansfield that was fine but then he was going you want to see Stallone's dick? I've got the Italian stallion. You want to see Stallone's dick? And we're just like, no, it's, it's fine, mate. Honestly, we go, no, I'll, I'll show you. I show, I've got it here. He takes a shower. You see his dick? And I'm just like, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> it was just so weird. Anyway, we, we've got the World Wide World of Jay Mansfield, which is absolutely wonderful, and has Rocky Roberts and the Air Jones doing a, a Surfing Bird spin-off number. I mean, what more could you want? <laughs> We did an LP with just trailers from all the movies that we owned and a lot of the Ron Haydock and the Bopper stuff were used and then things like Get Off the Road from She Devils on Wheels. We are the Hellcats nobody likes Man eaters on motorbikes The Cramps covered the theme from She Devils and Wheels. I was a huge Cramps fan. I ended up luckily getting to know them really well and I toured with them and, and I used to book their, all their support acts when they were in London, which was just a real thrill. I mean, they, they, they're Lux and Ivy. They, they, knew, they knew the stuff inside out. I mean, I, I remember the first time we supported them and we, they were sound checking and we were by sound checking. Oh my God, it's the Cramps, oh my God. And I went up to Ivy after they'd finished the sound check and I said, look, I, I really want to know your version of Rocking Bones, I'm taking it, you've got uh, was the Elroy Dietzel version and not the Ronnie Dawson version because you've got the, cry, the call and response thing. And she's like, how the hell do you know who Elroy Dietzel is in England? And I said, I've got, I've got the copy of the single, I've got, I've got both versions, but I just wanted to do that. And then so they knew that we were big fans and they always used to film themselves and they always do. And Lux said to me when they hear you bow or... Do you want to take my camera and film, film some of the set? I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. I, and I hadn't done much filming at that point. So I looked at the camera and I thought, film two or three numbers. I'm like, right, I'll put it on pause and I'll go and get a beer. A beer. I'll go back do a bit more. And I, what I'd done is press play when I was going to get the beer and then had it on pause while I was... And so at the end, he just said, that was the most interesting um, video of what, any of our gigs I've ever seen, Bal. It was great. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. And then after that, I had a band for a short time, a very silly band called Ugg and the Cavemen, where I dressed up like, like Fred Flintstone and all the band were in leopard skin, and we did songs like Be a Caveman and Go Gorilla. I never knew what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I'd never had plans for it, so I'd been in a band, and then off the back of that, I opened a video shop, and all the sort of spin-offs that could do that with the movie the video label. But, because I was doing that, then I started actually appearing on TV. There was like review show TV. There was a girl called Marella Foster, and she used to do a video review show on BBC Two. And I, I was brought in to do a sort of cult corner thing where I was doing my type of movies, and I was being interviewed about my movie label. So I was meeting people from TV. And about that time, I saw a documentary about Appalachian hillbilly music, and it was really wild. There was just all these women with massive beehives holding rattlesnakes and screaming while they're playing this sort of mad rockabilly in church and all these people getting bitten by rattlesnakes and drinking car battery acid and I was just going, what the hell is, 
I want, that's what I want to do, make some documentary, like, I want to be in telly, that looks bloody main, mental. And just weirdly, one of the guys that directed me, I rang him up and said, um, David, I want to be in telly, what do I do? And he said, I'm going for a job at this company up the road, why don't you go and talk to the producer? So I went and met this woman, she'd worked with Jonathan Ross, I said, oh, I know Jonathan, and she's like, all right, you've got a job. And so I, I left, I shot Psychotronic and I started working in telly. Tony bought the name off me and, and carried it on. The shop sort of staggered on after I finished with it. I paid him three and a half thousand pounds, lock, stock and barrel for the war fittings, every video in the plane scene, whatever. Roughly about, I think it was like 1991-ish, 92, Tony Clark took over and uh, Lino stayed. <laughs> but I think Bannock just had enough. I was being selfish. I didn't want it to end. Tony's a regular coming into the shop. And I knew that Tony was interested. As soon as I arranged for him, for Tony to buy the shop from him, literally the day after he fell off the face of the earth. And what I think Tony brought to the shop was a big, much bigger world than Bath was giving. We'd moved up to the main Camden market area. It had just been taken over. Um, rents and rates were increasing. It, there was a mass exodus in Camden at the time, and most of the long term businesses and rock and roll shops were closing down. And customers were dwindling. The internet had taken over. We, we should have gone online maybe earlier and promoted ourselves more, but we were stuck in the way of just running the shop as it was. I'm not a businessman. I, it, was, it was just sort of flying by the seat of my pants um, and just loving the stuff and just putting it out there. I remember David clothes, slightly depressing, and we went to see Fabio and Fritzi at the, at the chapel, so not an awful day, but... It just seems ever so prophetic that the last day of the shop, we were all at that gig together. Everybody from the shop, it was who was there. And it was very, very, very interesting, kind of, uh, seemed like an end of an era. I mean, my main, my main thing is that I regret a lot of the stuff that we didn't get to do because we've been speaking to Timothy Carey about doing the world's greatest sinner, talking about getting to come over to London to do his stage play, the insect trainer. Um, he's going to do a Rudy Ray Moore and Blowfly gig screenings at the Scala. There's so many things that could have happened but didn't happen. You know, when I look at it, those guys got me into a lot of music and they got me into a lot of movies, particularly the Stecklers. I mean, I was itching to see the Incredibly Strange Creatures. I'd never seen it and they put it out and it was exciting. I, I think there was, it was anything of making a huge killing financially. I think it was sort of labour of love and just having a laugh. Just go to, leave the shop, go to the pub, come back pissed, take all the takings out of the till and go back to the pub and then and, and go to the Scala and watch a bunch more movies and then someone go, hey, I know who's got the rights to this film, let's go and get them. Let's ring up Herschel Gordon Lewis and fly him in. Okay, yeah, great. It was it was hilarious, it was brilliant, really good fun.